We're at, first week was overview plus uh, one country up close in the sense of trying to look at specific issues in that country. Every country is different, every locality is different, every person is different. Now we're going to step back and uh, look at the world um, with respect to poverty and uh, development. And uh, in particular, um, we're going to be using sources of information um, that are available, freely available on the web. Okay, so we'll talk um, about sort of a global view of poverty. Um, for this, uh, we'll be going to the UN, the United Nations, and the World Bank. All right, um, and uh, I want to tell you about this information. Um, you essentially, when you look at this information, it's it's. Uh, very cold, analytical, distant, fuzzy. It's like, eh, what does that mean? You know, what's another billion people in poverty? What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything, hardly. It, it's not a. It's very hard to comprehend. Okay, when you look this from this far away. Um, but in reality, um, since you've seen, you know, Chino Rosa, you know, Victor, or these people, you know, it's 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 also shocking. It's incomprehensible. You know, the, you remember in the movie they said 1.1 billion under a dollar a day in the world. Well, all right, so multiply an individual there by a billion. A billion's a big number. I mean, think about the size of a billion. A million's a big number. Billions, like wow. And they're all all over the world in the in different situations. You know, um, but they're clearly living in a very very bad situation. I have had, done a lot of work trying to figure out what it's like living on a dollar a day besides doing it myself some. But, you know, that's just completely unrealistic for me to do it because I got, you know, I can fall back and eat whatever I want, whatever I want. Um, but from my reading, it appears that when you're on a dollar a day, you're, you're basically um, hungry and, and somewhat at least malnourished. Um, um, it would, that's clear. Okay. Um, and uh, the dollar, when they say a dollar D, you got to interpret that properly. That's an average, okay? It is not like they're getting a dollar a day. They can go a number of days with zero. So the idea from the movie I really liked was, you know, they were drawing the little things zero to nine. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a really important idea that, that your income is random. That's very hard to understand the implications of that. Um, because you know we're used to thinking of you know you get the salary you, you people start out at sixty what sixty to sixty five thousand dollars a year after BS and you know it's not like your boss comes the next day and varies your salary by a hundred percent oh we're not paying you next week and next week we're going to double it though or it'll average out don't worry about it ouch so so uh, we'll be talking more about that issue but let's take a look at the data. Um, so first thing is there's a big problem with defining poverty. Nobody, there's some consensus on how to define it, but just realize that um, when somebody says poverty, um, a lot of people mean economic poverty. They mean money. You don't have a lot of money. Um, and uh, but other people would say poverty is a poverty of the spirit or the mind or it's lack of happiness. It's it's an emotional thing, whatever. So. I'm not going to stand up here and try to say what poverty is because there's too much disagreement on it. But we're going to look at some of the popular ways of uh, characterizing it. Um, the single measure is typically, um, you know, average income. And, uh, but there's money measures. A very popular one um, is to use income, educational attainment, and health. With, but they measure health by life expectancy. And I put this in this nonlinear function. It, it outputs what's called the Human Development Index, HDI. Um, and it, it's a pretty intriguing idea because, you know, it's saying then that to have good human development, you'll have to have money. You've got to be making money. You've got to get an education. Okay. So income sets like your standard of living is the way they think of this. Uh, you need education, so you educate the mind, and then you have to have health, okay? All three. And uh, it's uh, pretty well, a lot of people think along these lines. 
And no, a lot of people are not willing to say which is most important. Okay? If any of you have lost your health, okay, you will understand that that is the key issue in a certain sense, right? But if you don't have an education, of course, that impacts all the aspects of your life. And if you don't have money, that impacts everything too, even your health. We'll come back to that issue. They're very much coupled. Now, there's this confusing thing of inequality. Um, it's somewhat baffling why inequality matters. Um, you're gonna be watching for one of your homeworks a TED Talk on why inequality matters um, for a whole host of reasons. And it, it's, you watch this guy, he has a great talk. And then you're like, what? So he'll say things like, okay, it is not the absolute level of poverty in a country that matters, it's the relative level. In other words, the spread between the rich and the poor is what makes all kinds of bad things happen, not necessarily how low that bottom end is. It's how far they are away from the top. It's like, what? Okay, so inequality matters. It, it, it's not a simple matter to understand why you'll have a homework problem on it. But they, they modify the HDI to get the IHDI to consider um, inequality. Then there's something called the multiple poverty index, which has got a whole mess of measures. Um, there's all kinds of measures, okay? So if you don't like it, what you're seeing as a measure, I'm sure somebody else has tried to define it differently. I mean, it's, it, there's all kinds of definitions. Um, now, they, they might put a weighted average, for instance. They might say, you know, you might, you might take your in, I might come to you and say, what's your income, what's your education, what's your health? And I put weights on those, sum them up, and I say, that's your human development. Somebody might do that, okay? Um, but the problem is, is what weights, and there's nonlinear combinations, blah, blah, blah. Um, the other problem is, is using one number to represent the severity of poverty is, is, is really frowned on by a lot of people. Okay, um, and uh, you know we do that. Um, it's done all over the world. I mean, this is what's done in the United States. We're we talking about the poverty line in the United States and being up and above and below it. So this this is done quite a bit um, as a way to simplify. The other problem is is it's very hard to measure everything. Um, I think it's it's really a, a wrong-headed way to think to think that I could quantify numerically poverty. Engineers have a tendency to want to quantify things, uh, and then say this is the situation with poverty or human development when there's many other aspects that have nothing to do with numbers. How do you char characterize spirituality with numbers? How do you characterize emotions with numbers? Okay, or social exclusion, which means you know things with discrimination, not being allowed to participate. Well, there's tons of things that are very important in life to us that aren't going to be quantified with numbers, really. So, so don't think that there's anything definitive about this way of defining poverty. It's just, it's, a lot of times what they're doing is they're picking ways to measure these things that are easy to measure. So they can send people, you know, when you start seeing this data, you'll be like, holy cow, how can they collect that much data? It's unbelievable what they do. I mean, the UN, World Bank, they're sending tons of people out in the field and gathering data. It's very difficult to measure things, okay? So they're trying to pick things they can easily measure, etc. So let's talk about context. There's 7.2 billion people in the world. Last time, the day I taught this lecture last year, there were 7.1, yes? Sorry, I have a quick question about, uh, you're talking about the, the poverty index versus the that those development indexes on the last slide, should we go back for a second? Yeah. So the difference between HDI and IHDI. So I know uh, it talked about, in the book it talked about the, the Guinea index, which yeah. I think was a measure of inequality. inequality inequality with income distribution. Um, so I was wondering for the IHDI if that's supposed to be a measure of the HDI that's been adjusted for inequality, or if IHDI is a measure of inequality in HDI. It's, it's the first thing you said. So it's adjusted? It's adjusted by, by inequality. Okay. And if you want the specific formula, it's actually, and I, I'm really attracted <laughs> to formulas, as you can see, they're probably the only professor who's ever put in a, such a long mathematical formula about grades, the first lecture, but the formulas are actually pretty complex. They use something called the Atkinson Inequality Index, not the Gini. 
Um, and uh, it requires you to measure inequalities on um, the axes of, of health, um, um, income, and education, because those will have variances for this is country level. So those will have variances. And then there's inequality between each of those. So if you have a rich country that's unhealthy, that's more unequal, and therefore it would give you a lower score for IHDI. It's, 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 a, comp, it's a pretty complicated mathematical formula, actually. Okay, um, so 7.2 billion people in the world. Um, I don't know, nobody, nobody seems to agree on how many countries we have in the world. Um, 190, 196, there's 193 UN member states. But, you know, like Palestine get upset and say, you know, we're a state um, and so on and so forth. So it's you can't really say how many countries there are in a world because that's controversial. Uh, to give you some definitions uh, that normally engineers don't work with, the gross domestic product is so the market value of officially recognized goods and services. So that's not like drugs, okay, and, and sex trade and things like that. This is this is officially recognized goods and services produced by a country in a year. Then you have GDP per capita, or the gross domestic income. That's not the average income of individuals in a country. If you have a whole bunch of people, you have a few of those people are making a ton, ton, ton of money by producing goods, then clearly that's, that has nothing to do with the average income of the people in the country. Okay. Then there's a, the gross <coughs> national product, which is commonly referred to also as the gross national income. So that's the market value of products produced by enterprise owned by the country's citizens. So that includes, the, some people call this the, the diaspora. <coughs> so it's US people all over the world. You know, like I, if I'm here and I own a company, uh, let's say I own a sweatshop in the Philippines or in, in Bangladesh, that's counted in the GNI for the US. Okay. Um, so, with that context, we're going to start before we get to date too much data. We'll do a little bit of data. Um, we're going to talk a little about the Millennium Development Goals. They were over this 25-year uh, uh, period, 1990 to 2015. It's ending this year. Okay. Um, and I get this from the UN Millennium Development Goals website. Um, then they're going to move, they're right now in the process of developing the next set of goals. Um, those are called the Sustainable Development Goals. I'll be covering those a little later. So, Millennium Development Goal number one. Um, first one was extreme, if you look at it, since, so we're going, since 1990 till today, extreme poverty rates have been cut in half since then. Wow. That's something to be proud of. Now, <coughs> so what we're talking about with extreme poverty, we're, we're talking about, uh, depending on what level you define, it's usually a, people define it as a dollar a day or a dollar 25 a day. And uh, so that's really a profound um, reduction. If you look at where the reduction came, it seems that the bulk, a, a good portion of the reduction came in China and India, especially China, okay? Um, because of their opening up of trade policies, et cetera, okay? Next. Um, Yet, worldwide, one in eight people remain hungry. However, you're going to define that. You know, that's complicated to define what it means to be hungry, right? I mean, I'm hungry right now. Okay, but you, I think you know what I mean. I mean, it, it's going to bed hungry. It's things like that. Okay. Next goal number two: enrollment of primary education in developing regions has reached ninety percent. That's boys and girls. That's amazing. Okay, so that's it's really um, also something to be proud of. Uh, but there's still 57 million that are not being educated. Now, we're going to be talking in some detail about that 57 million later in class when we talk about development in international education. Okay, next. Um, so, coupled to that 90%. It says we've achieved quality. It's about 1% difference between boys and girls in that primary education, okay, which is incredible. Now, however, uh, women still face discrimination. Everybody says that. Whatever I read, there's a huge problem. I, I read something <laughs> it was by Martha Nussbaum. We'll talk about her later. It says, there's no country in the world where a, a woman is treated as equal to a man. 
And, you know, it's true. Every country I've been in, it's true. It's true in this country, for sure. Um, like, what they mean by that is an access to education, work, and particip participation in decision making. And uh, this is um, most certainly a big problem. Uh, if anybody's interested, um, I, I would recommend you read this book, Half the Sky. Has anybody read it? Half the Sky. It's by Nicholas Kristof, the editor, editor uh, one of the editorialists for uh, New York Times, and his wife. Uh, um, and uh, it's really a great book. Um, talks about uh, women's issues worldwide. Um, next, so child mortality. So 17,000 fewer children die each day than in 1990. Whew. Wow, that's really good. But six million children still die before their fifth birthday, which is really bad. Now, how are they dying? Well, some of the major killers are things like um, malaria, um, contaminated water, um, uh, indoor air pollution, like the cook stove, you know, you saw in the movie, the cook stove, the smoke, and the, you know, this is terrible for respiratory diseases and so forth. So there's a lot of reasons why children are still um, dying. Um, maternal mortality fell by 47% since 1990. So we're seeing a lot of health factors really improving. Um, but only half of women in developing regions receive the recommended health care during pregnancy. They're not getting prenatal. I mean, in the United States, it's sort of like, yes, I mean, you, it's unheard of not to get prenatal care, you know, <laughs> for a pregnant woman. But uh, you see half, only half getting it is, is really a problem. Number six, so 97 million people were receiving life-saving medicines for HIV. Um, which is a lot, and there's a 1.1 million malaria deaths were prevented in the span of 10 years. You know how you do that? You do this really sophisticated technological thing. You get a bed net, cost four dollars, and it saves lives. It's proven. You get a bed net to just keep the mosquitoes off you. Okay. Um, of course, medical treatment after you get malaria. You don't die if you get malaria necessarily. You get medical treatment, you can recover fine. Okay. Uh, depending on every, a lot of things, but uh, 7 million people still lacked access to antiretroviral um, therapy for HIV, and 80% of malaria deaths occur um, in just 14 days. It got chopped off, sorry. Um, the U.S. has a pretty large program for Africa for antiretrovirals, but more could be done, that's for sure. Next, uh, the ever important issue of water. 2.1 billion people in those 25 years gained access to clean drinking water. Wow, things were really bad in 1990. Okay, so things have really improved. But uh, and, and right now, uh, if I remember the numbers right now, it's at 800 million people don't have clean drinking water. Okay, so we still have, it's still a significant problem without a doubt. And the connected issue of sanitation is even bigger. So look at that number. 2.5 billion don't have basic sanitation like toilets and latrines. Did you see Bill Gates launch an initiative in the Gates Foundation to design the new toilet for the world? Why is he doing that? Because of this. Okay? And it's a big problem. Keep in mind, sanitation matters because if you, if you pollute, you, you often are polluting your water source, and it creates a major health problem, okay? Not to mention bugs and um, tons of issues. Yes? How do you count these people? Because this 2.1 billion people may also include the people who were born in those, like, yeah. in the families which already had those facilities. It's very hard to count these people, yeah. 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 No, you're right. I don't trust that number out there. Yeah, you got, you're right. There's, there's the, the problem is, is that, um, you have people being, in that time period of 25 years, you have, what you're pointing out is there's people that are, are dying and being born too. So they gotta take that all into account. Yeah, it's not simple. It's not, I'm glad you're thinking about the data because the data are not simple to get. And in fact, when you look at how they get the data, it's sometimes a little depressing. So how do they get the, the I'll come to the poverty data in a minute, okay, about how they get it. It's, it's uh, a little disappointing. These are broad big picture numbers, 
You don't worry about whether you're off by one. You worry if you're off by half a billion or a hundred million. If you talk about countries like India and China, the birth rate has, is, more, is much more than the death rates. So, like, since they've al already considered half exactly. of the population. Exactly. If it's going up and then I get clean water and I have more kids, suddenly they all have clean water and it looks better. Sure. Exactly. No, that's, that's certainly true. Okay, um, on number eight, uh, global partnership. So debt services declined for developing countries. Look, this is a big issue, a big financial issue for some developing countries. They have, uh, let's say you got a dictator and he uh, takes out a loan, billions, pockets half of it, corruption for most of the other, hardly <laughs> helps the people, but then the country's got to pay it back after he's gone after he's assassinated or whatever. What happens to the country then? You think that debt is forgiven? Well, there was a movement about 10 years ago and they were forgiven debt. A lot of debt is not forgiven. This burdens these countries. They can't get out of debt. Um, <clears throat> trade situation is really a complicated issue. We like, in the US, they like to talk about free trade. Yeah, well, be cynical. Because look at your European and US policy on, on trade. A lot of our trade policy is driven by our own interest, of course, protecting our farmers or our industries. And what's happening in, in, at the global level is that those protections are shutting out commodities from the developing world entirely. It's a big, big, big problem. Because how can we fix it when all the lobbying is happening within the US towards Congress, whatever, and the big dollars are flowing, and we're not opening up. We're not buying mangoes from India or whatever. You know, I mean, this, this is a big issue. Well, I see, a, I hear people um, complaining about this issue and feeling that it's one of the most fundamentally important things for develop the developing world is to simply level the playing field and let them play. Um, next. Uh, crucial aid is falling, they say. That means donor dollars, for instance, or government dollars. The governments of the world, of the, the rich countries, I'm sorry, of the rich countries have committed um, a certain percentage of the GDP. I think, it's, uh, I think it's, it's only around a percent. And they've done it more than one time, but they're all falling short. There's a few European countries that are where they should be, but we're falling short. Okay? And you know how much politically charged aid is in the United States, you know, giving, they just feel like, oh, people, people think we are giving so much aid, go study the numbers, we hardly give a thing, relative to our GDP, okay, you got to be careful when you look at what's being <laughs> relative to our GDP, and how is the aid given, is it given for political reasons, okay, our alliances that we have. Rather, or, or is it, you know, does the U.S. care about some ex, I'm not going to pick on one country, but you know what I'm saying. Some countries, the U.S. just couldn't care less because they're not going to do anything for us. But if they're a militarily strategic partner, uh, everything changes. Okay, so, you know, you got to look at what's really happening on the ground for these sorts of things. It's, a, it's, it's really problematic. I used to not think this way, but the more I read, I have to admit that there are some really deep problems. Okay, income poverty. You gotta get used to thinking about poverty um, in terms of dollars the way international development does. So what, what they do is the following. They take the US dollar and they consider it the international dollar, which is not a US dollar, it's just the quote international dollar. And it's, they use the dollar sign rather than all these other symbols are used for currencies. Then they do two things. They do, they do a type of conversion. So they, they convert from every country in the world to the international dollar. Now, when they do that conversion, um, they take into account exchange rate at the time the conversion is done. Okay. And they do another thing that's a little trickier. They use something called, they measure something called purchasing power. They imagine there being a basket of goods that you would buy in a country. Let's say Guatemala. I got a basket of goods in Guatemala that cost me this much. I got a basket of the same goods in the United States, it cost me this much. And then with the exchange rate, this is conversions done. So if I say, if I say to you, I spend one dollar 
in Guatemala, what I mean is it's the same as if I bought the same products <coughs> for one dollar in the United States. Okay? That's called PPP, purchasing power parity. Okay? So when we when they quote that you know people are making less than a billion, 1.1 billion people are making less than a dollar a day, this is what they mean. So that's that's pretty scary because what it means is is you can actually understand what it's like to live like Chino at a dollar a day. All you gotta do is spend only a dollar a day here. Okay? So what I propose is a solidarity challenge is an accurate challenge for what they're they're living under. Broadly speaking, I, I know it's this is this conversion is very difficult, of course. But broadly speaking, it's accurate. Um, so in in um, the example of Guatemala, 13.5% of Guatemala makes less than a um, dollar twenty-five a day, PPP, in 2012 by, via the World Bank. That's 1.8 million people of 15 million. Franklin County, Ohio has 1.2 million people. So quite a bit. <coughs> it's like that many. I'm trying to give you a sense. I keep comparing to Ohio because we have some comparable. Remember, it's almost the same land mass. Guatemala is 15 million people. Ohio is 11 and a half million people. So just think of them as the same size and people. And, and you start to see, you know, that's a lot of people in poverty, okay? Okay, now let's look at the big picture. There's these really cool things, uh, even though it's looking at depressing data, um, called the visualizers. So the World Bank has a data visualizer. Um, they also have a poverty data finder on, on your uh, app, on your phone. Uh, and what you can do is um, search for regions, countries, etc. So you can see, I just did a screenshot here. Um, this is for the poverty head count, $1.25 a day PPP as a percentage of the population. And you look at the, the, the size of the bubbles, <laughs> red bubbles. A size mean a bigger size, of course, is higher percentage. And uh, you can do that for any all these countries, not every country in the world. Um, some countries don't have data on, and, and U.S. often don't have data on. They don't have, you see, they don't have a bubble on the U.S. But you see our country right there, right? See Guatemala? See the bigger bubble? I mean, uh, you see the size of the bubbles in Africa? Wow. This is tough, okay? We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, now, this comes from the UN Public Data Visualizer. Um, you can get an app for it, too. Um, so this is $1.25 a day PPP as a percent of the population, where uh, red, more red is a is, uh, higher percentage of population. Yes? Can these numbers account for any government aid that people receive? Like, how is that factored in? It would. The way they're collecting this data, the best we've been on, my, my PhD student, Ugo, um, helped me figure this out. So he says that what they actually do is, they, they, let's say they walk in the village and they do an interview on one day. An interview, and then they average, and then they say, ah, you make a dollar a day. You make 80 cents a day. Well, make or consume. Is this making a dollar a day or living on a dollar a day? Consumed? It is making. Okay. So they that, that's the way I understand it. It's making a dollar a day. But most of that's being consumed if you're at a dollar a day. Uh -huh. okay. And this is including, uh, by the way, your own farm products. This isn't necessarily cash. This, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it's, it's everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so you look at this situation, and uh, it's not good. You see the little red dot there in the Caribbean? That's um, Haiti. Um, and uh, you see the big country in the South, this Sub-Saharan Africa. People always talk about Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, that you see the colored region, that's Sub-Saharan Africa. The country there and a the big one in the middle is, anybody name it? Yeah, Democratic Republic of Congo. Woo, talk about problems there. Yeah, very big problems, okay? And uh, well, there's a number of other countries there. So in Madagascar has got an issue. Um, so, uh, that's the dollar. Now, what we're going to do, this, this website's so cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to step back and we're going to raise, do everybody under a higher amount of money, okay? So the map is going to become more and more colorful, okay? So let's do that. Here's $5 a day, okay, PPP. <laughs> well, yes? 
Um, are the countries that are kind of like dark grayed out, like over, you can see a few countries in Africa and Mongolia, did they just not get enough data there? Yeah, okay. they, they don't have data. They were either, the, you know, there could have been turmoil in the country, a war, or there could have been all kinds of regions. Um, and like a country like the U.S. may not, may refuse to participate even. I don't know why they don't have, there's a lot of places you go in these sites where they don't have U.S. data and they really ought to. Um, so, but you can find it in other places. It's a little difficult. Um, so the $5 day poverty you see is, is prevalent in um, the continent of Africa um, and uh, you know, have issues with India. Um, you see a couple countries in Central America popping up there with uh, Guatemala and Honduras, for instance, uh, El Salvador. Um, and then others coming up, you know, you see this region um, of dark orange in uh, in Latin America, for instance. <laughs> um, so $5 a day. Now, before I go further, I want to give you a, a way to think about the world. In the U.S., we often talk about Lower class, middle class, upper class. Remember Obama last night? Middle class economics. Okay? So, how do, how, what's a way to think about that for the world? So, the extreme poverty case we've already talked about. Just think of it. Billion people under a dollar a day. R roughly. Okay? Now, turns out that 80% of the world is under $10 a day. That ain't good. Okay? And then you have 10% uh, of the world is the rich, okay? 10% uh, is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's Europe and U.S. and Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. And, and I may have forgotten one. That's the rich world, okay? So, so uh, ten, it's only 10% of the world that's really living the way we're living here, okay? Um, and... Uh, I think that um, what's, I'm going to give you the data now, but we'll come to it in more detail later. Homo, to give you a sense for, since we have quite a few Americans in here, to give you a point of reference, um, the average um, amount of money of income of a homeless person in the United States, we have uh, 643,000 uh, homeless people in the United States. Um, we have, uh, and their average salary is um, $12 a day. So our homeless people are, richer than 80% of the world. Wow. Okay. So, so that, that gives you a, a more tangible way um, to think about the issues. We'll go into more details about the homeless uh, next class period. Okay. Um, the Gini index. Um, so the way this index works, and then again, there's a mathematical formula. I'm not, it's easy enough to think about. If, you, if it's a highly unequal um, country, it, Gini index is one. If it's completely equal, it's zero. And then, as you suspect, with in between. So if you, you just think of standing up in bars, each person's income in this room, the, if, if uh, we were all equal, it would, Gini index would be zero. So it's measuring a deviation off of zero equality. Um, and you look at the map, and uh, um, you can see there's some serious inequality problems um, in the, you know, the region of South Africa and, and through Latin America, um, Russia, um, less so in India and Northern Africa. Um, the U.S. Is, is not like equal. They don't have data here. We'll look at data later. Uh, the U.S. is actually quite unequal compared to the world. We, we have a very, very unequal society. Okay, we'll, we'll, but we'll get to that later when we talk about U.S. poverty. Okay, um, now, the Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index is, is this. And this, this plot says a lot about where things are at. So green down to very deep red or black, it shows you uh, the current situation in terms of human development in the world at the country level. So on, on the one hand, you've got this... Uh, uh, you see, see, U.S. isn't at the top. It's it's below um, the the Norway, Sweden. Norway is the richest country in the world by some measures. U.S. is the richest country in the world in terms of bulk of wealth. I mean, the, we're pretty big. We're the third largest country in the world. Okay. Um, 
you see Europe's all green. Look at look at the wealth the wealth and um, human development in, in Australia. Then you got the U.S. You know, similar probably to France and England, uh, and then it then it goes from there. Um, you know, you can see you can just track with your eye. You know, like look at yellow, and then orange, deeper dark orange. You're seeing down into the red. You're seeing Guatemala, and then you're going down. You're in Af You're in India, and then below that is the many Af sub sub Saharan Africa countries and. Then you got the Democratic Republic of Congo that seems to be like, you know, at the bottom. Okay. So uh, this shows you sort of a, a sense of gives you a sense of where there's um, need, right? I mean, um, in terms of humanitarian engineering, um, it's uh, <laughs> and yet we're going to discuss that. I mean, just because it's a green country doesn't mean that it doesn't need humanitarian engineering. I'm pretty adamant about that. I know, I know plenty of situations in the United States, for instance, where humanitarian, humanitarian engineering is needed, such as in Columbus, Ohio. Um, World Food Program. So this plot is, um, just think of uh, the, the deeper red um, as being places where people are hungrier. Unfortunately, we see Guatemala quite not a very good situation. Okay. Um, but unsurprisingly we see the sub-saharan africa issue on the rising in terms of food too okay this is from the world food program um corruption corruption is quite a large problem um okay so from like r deep red to yellow um this is corruption perceptions index so it means you just interview a bunch of people and you say you think your government's corrupt or you think this is corrupt they say yes or no, and then you just compile the data. You know, because corruption's hidden. It's very hard to measure, right? <laughs> um, and you see, uh, what's interesting here, Canada comes out looking pretty good. Uh, Australia, Norway, <laughs> Sweden, certain parts of Europe, but then Latin America is not looking real good there, um, in my opinion. I mean, Mexico, etc. And when I've traveled there, yeah, that's what people say about their government. They don't, they don't trust their government. They think they're corrupt. Um, and then you have other issues with Russia and, uh, again, Africa. Um, next, gender inequality. Okay, so gender inequality index is at the UN website. Um, it's, it's actually, it's very interesting what, how they come up with this. So the, it's an aggregate measure of maternal mortality. Okay, in other words, dying uh, during pregnancy or while giving birth, for instance. Uh, adolescent fertility, okay. So young girls um, may be forced to get married or just having babies. Uh, percentage of women holding seats in the national parliament. Percentage of population with at least a secondary education as compared to men. And percentage of labor, fo labor force participation rate compared to men. So are they getting jobs? Are they put in leadership position? Are they getting education? How's their health? It's kind of like a, a women's human development index is the way you could think about it. So you think, oh, we're number one in the U.S. Baloney. We are not. It's pretty depressing. So we rank, we have 186 countries that are ranked in the state. We, we ranked 42, where one is number one, is the best. We're 42. Okay. So... So who's around us? Well, United Arab Emirates ranked better than us. Albania was 41, ranked better than us. Okay. Now other other uh, you know you you can go look at your own countries, but um, you know it it ain't pretty. I can tell you that. Um, it, it's it's a it's quite a large problem. I I think if in my view. If half the people in this class are women, which it roughly it was, right? Um, I think the women, it, it's up to you people what you want to do. But I think when I talk to women about this issue, some will not bias what they do towards a man or a woman in humanitarian engineering. Other women in humanitarian engineering say, I want to help women. I want to help girls. Do it. Go for it. Because they're real issues. 
I mean, if you want to focus on an important issue, this is an important issue. And there are ways. You, you can't, I don't, I don't say way with technology, again, just to repeat myself from the other day, to, to end discrimination of women by technology. But you can empower women. Target women, empower women, and let them get the respect. I think you can do that. I think it can be very effective. Why do you think, and this happens all the time in the US, right? We emphasize trying to teach girls STEM. There are programs for that, for instance. So I think you can do something. I think it's important to do. I think it's important to understand this too. When you walk into a situation in a country, and let's say you're gonna work with a community and it has a very, very um, bad GII, and, and, and then you're, it sort of prepares you because when you start working with the, the, the group, how are the women gonna be treated? Are they gonna be asked for their opinions? Are they gonna be included in the project or not? Okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna see indications of that um, problem. Next, so that's all the money stuff, or health stuff, or education stuff. What about technology and engineering? So the UN Public Data Explorer has stuff on technology and engineering. Um, things like the electrification rate. How many, how many people you think in the world don't have electricity, roughly? I mean, you know, like regular supply. It's 1.6 billion. Ouch. Okay. Um, fixed broadband internet subscription per 100 people. International total incoming um, telephone traffic minutes, outgoing traffic minutes, internet users per 100 people, research and development expenditure. <coughs> Researchers and research and development per 1 million. Royalty license fees, total patents. Okay, there's also a section in the World Bank um, information on data on science and technology. Okay, so I think you can learn about this. The one piece of data that's not here, but I, I've quoted other times, so get this, there's over six billion people in the world that have a cell phone subscription. Wow. This is a shocking thing. You go do a trip and do humanitarian engineering, the person doesn't have electricity, you know, very tough situation. Throw in a cell phone chat and it's like, what? <laughs> so it's happening. Cell phone. I mean, humans value communication with each other, right? That's what it says. And it's an opportunity. How can you piggyback on it? Every, everybody's now trying to figure out how to piggyback on the cell phone to help people, like financial services over the cell phone. Okay, that's a very important idea. Uh, next, I want to know whether we should have an optimistic or pessimistic view. So, global poverty indicators from the World Bank, poverty headcount ratio, uh, $1.25 a day, PPP as a percent of the population in 1990 was 43% and it's gone to 20% in 20 years. Wow. People living on less than 125 a day in millions went from 1.9 million to 1.2 million. Uh, I'm sorry, billion. 1.9 billion to 1.2 billion in 2010. Now it's a little bit lower too. That, those are good trends. I mean, that's, that's looking really positive. Look at it another way. Here's a, a, from the Human Development Report in 2013. This is the Human Development Index per year. So on a, the horizontal scale is zero to one, the HDI value. On the vertical axis is year, okay, 1980 up to, you know, like 2013. And look, I mean, look, step back and look at the big picture. The world is, everything's improving, almost. You know what those lines are that are going like down? That's really depressing. Those are certain countries, for instance, in Africa, where the, 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 they're not getting better. Things are not getting better, they're getting worse. Ooh, okay, that's tough. So, but those are good reasons to be optimistic, right? I mean, this, this problem seems to be getting solved. Here's another way to look at it. This Brookings Institution Report in 2013, um, so this is the poverty rate, um, and, uh, um, and it's, it's going down clearly. That's the poverty rate worldwide. It's very difficult to compute that because every country, and there's different ways to compute it, but it's the broad trend that matters. So if you look at the, um, the different numbers here, what they do is they plot what has been happening, going from 
down to almost 20%. And then the experts are saying, well, what's the best that could happen? What's the worst that can happen? And um, that's that envelope that you see on the far right in gray, okay? And uh, some people are, you know, look at these numbers. So we're, we're sitting there at 2015. Well, you're talking 15 years, the optimistic estimates are gonna put poverty, extreme poverty at almost zero. Wow. That's why Jeffrey Sachs titled his book, The End of Poverty. It's coming. But the extreme poverty, the dollar a day stuff. <coughs> But it could, it, could be, it could flatten out, so we don't know. I mean, of course, you can't predict the future, okay? Um, next way to look at that is this Shandy report that I referenced in, in the book. Um, this plots, a, it takes a minute to understand, but so look at the, um, the horizontal axis is mean daily consumption in PPP, so uh, you see $1, $2, $3, $4, $5, $10, and then um, the number of people in millions on the vertical axis, and then that's the distribution that you're seeing there. So if you have the dark blue, in 1990, the dark blue was the distribution of how <coughs> people were living. Um, you can see that many people were living on even um, around a dollar a day or less on, in the mean peak. And then you, what matters in this plot in many ways is the, the way the peak is moving. See it moving to the right, to the right, to the right, and it's coming up, up, up. That's good, right? So, so that's the distribution shape, and, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's moving to the right. People are making, on average, more and more money, and it's coming up. So there's more and more people that were making a dollar a day are now making you know, five or six dollars a day. That's looking good. That's another positive thing. Yes? Uh, does that factor in inflation or just imagine that it's not going to be prominent? We're, we're uh, yes. Oh, yes. This will factor in inflation, yeah. Okay. It's hard to compute, though, because you're talking about yeah. every inflation <laughs> rate's different, even a different region. So you got to, don't, <laughs> you got to think about these things like big picture, mm -hmm. broad trends. Okay? Um, so, uh, just a few comments before we finish. Uh, there's a lot of other issues, and I don't like it to ignore a bunch of other issues. There's um, the United Nations alphabet soup, as I call it, is United Nations Development Program, the United Nations World Food Program, uh, United Nations um, oh geez. Environments. I think of them as doing it's culture, environment, science. Education, UNESCO is kind of a potpourri. UNWHO, World Health Organization. The problem of orphans uh, is, well, it's something near and dear to me. So 132 million orphans in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and the Caribbean in 2005. Um, those are defined as having lost one parent. Um, and there's 13 million that have lost both parents per UNICEF. Um, Homelessness is, you know, I think we have an issue, um, 100 million homeless people. I find this data shocking. I, uh, 315,000 street children in Mumbai. Um, uh, when you go to the developing world, this is something you see. There's children in the streets, and, and they're, a lot of times they're homeless. Sometimes they're not. Uh, slavery is, is a shocking thing that's going on. We have 2.5 million people in the world that are slaves. That means forced labor, forced sex, forced whatever you can think of. It's terrible. It's, it's one of the most evil things I've ever learned about. Um, if you want to learn about this issue, um, we have a graduate alum from OSU, Joe Chung Siriwatana. He is in Thailand, and he works for an NGO, and this is what he does with his life. He's, he got his master, BS in electrical engineering, master's in biomed. He's given his life to this fight in this problem, because Thailand's got one of the worst problems in the world. He's fighting child traffic. And he gives a talk on that. Actually, he made a call to OSU. He wants a team from OSU to go help him develop technology to track predators, to try to find children, use GIS systems, et cetera, um, in, uh, in Thailand. If anybody wants to do that, um, I think his, I got his email, or you can look at this. This is a, a, a video. He gives a talk about child trafficking, and then he... Um, um, Talks a little bit about technology. Um, he was here last year visiting. He got alumni work for College of Engineering. Okay, uh, that's it. Questions, comments?
It's a mess out there, isn't it? Try not to lose sight of the ground. Because these numbers, actually for me, I find it unfathomable. You know, you multiply Chino by a billion or whatever. I mean, I find that it's, it's, it's too much for the mind to comprehend what suffering is going on. But it's getting better. All right, see you.